you guys for joining. So Will put up his little screen, which he's very proud of. Um, so we have an exciting day today because number one, this is our 75th webinar. So Will and I have sat through 75 of these things, uh, which is a lot. And it's also exciting. Well, everyone keeps saying hi, which is nice. So we have people saying hi and somebody signed, I'm assuming this is not your real name. Somebody signed in as Lucifer Morningstar. Um, <laughs> What's, what show is that from again? That's like the devil. I know it's the devil, but it's from a television show. Sabrina. Sabrina. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> why don't we get started? We're going to talk a little bit about financial advice today. People are very excited. We're going to talk about financial advice today and talk about how as an independent investor, how you can get the same benefits that you could get from a financial advisor. And then if you're working with a financial advisor, how you can make sure that you get those benefits. Will is remembering to press the button so that we can, uh, we can record this. Um, and we'll put the recording up on YouTube and also on our website. Um, so anyway, let's get started. So general advice warning. So anything you hear today is general advice. I don't know anything about you, so I can't offer any personal advice. The other thing is I would like lots of questions, um, especially today, which I'll tell you about in a second, but lots of questions would be good and everyone can keep saying hi to each other. Um, so anyway, another exciting thing that happened today. So 75th webinar, um, I lost all of the slides about 25 minutes before we went on here. So that was not good, but we'll see how we go. And we're having drinks afterwards, not directly afterwards, but we're going to the Crown for drinks on this miserable Sydney day um, to celebrate a milestone with Investing Compass, which is our podcast that you should listen to. But anyway, let's get started. So as I said before, we're going to unlock the value of financial advice, even if you're self-advised. So a little bit of background around financial advice in Australia somewhere. Um, yeah, I'm very disorganized. Today. Anyway, a little bit of background around financial advice. Um, I think a lot of people have probably, and it's you know a little ways away at this point, or was a little ways away at this point, um, saw the Royal Commission uh, hearings that uh, that went on, and obviously they uncovered a a, a lot of behavior that is uh, inappropriate at best. Um, but, uh, but one of the things that, that came out of that is there's been a lot of changes in the industry recently. So I won't go through the whole history of financial advice in Australia, but at the end of the day, what's happening in Australia and what's happening in a lot of places is the industry has come from basically just a industry focus on selling product and pushing product, um, to hopefully where we're going, which is more focused on actual clients. Um, so we can talk a little bit about that, but. Traditionally, advisors in Australia were aligned with either large asset managers or banks. Um, now we're starting to see that model break up. And really, the reason that advisors were aligned with banks and financial institutions is to sell those products and push those products that were manufactured, created. So we're talking about funds, et cetera, that were created in the financial institutions that they were aligned to. And now, of course, we're seeing a fracturing of that model. And a lot of it came out of the Royal Commission and the findings that came out of that. So three sort of things that are going on in financial advice. As I said, a lot of financial institutions have sold or spun off their financial advice wing. So you're getting a lot of independent financial advisors now, which I think ultimately will be good. The other problem is that there has been an increased cost to deliver financial advice. So a lot of the reforms that have happened um, through multiple rounds, so the Royal Commission was just the latest one, through multiple rounds have led to more compliance costs. So it is more costly to deliver financial advice. And of course that gets passed on to the end customers. And then the third thing is education standards have recently been raised, which has led to a pretty large exodus of financial advisors. So we do have a situation right now where less and less people are able to access financial advice um, because of increased costs, because there's less advisors, and naturally advisors are going to service people that have more assets. So there is, uh, there is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of people in Australia that are underserved by the industry. So that's where hopefully today will be beneficial when we talk through some ways that you can get some of the benefits, and there are real benefits that come from financial advice, how you can get those as an independent investor. Um, okay, so let's get into this. So 
Apologies for the slides, but this was me trying to throw these things together while Will and Shawnee talked about, I don't know what, your upcoming Instagram um, appearance. But uh, what I did is we wrote a guide, um, the Morningstar Guide to Better Investing Outcomes, that sort of in a more comprehensive way covers this topic. Um, so what I've done is I've taken a couple things from, uh, from that guide that we can walk through that hopefully Lucifer Morningstar will enjoy. Um, so we've got, uh, we've got two different sides of this, and I wanna walk through some of the areas where Morningstar feels very strongly um, around how financial advice should be delivered and what we should look for as consumers of that and talk about what you should look for from an advisor to make sure they're following this approach, and then what you can do as an independent investor or self-directed investor that doesn't use an advisor. Um, so, all right, let's get started with a couple of these, and I'll, I'll spend more time on some of them. So focus on goal attainment. So um, we are big proponents here at Morningstar of a goals-based approach to investing. And for people that have tuned into some of these other ones, particularly our portfolio construction one, you are familiar, hopefully, with the process that we go through, where the whole point of investing, the whole reason that any of us invest is to try to accomplish a goal. We are not doing this um, for, uh, for fun. We're trying to accomplish a goal, whether that's retirement or saving for a house or living having a certain lifestyle, retiring early, whatever your goal is, and goals are unique to everyone, that is why we invest. And all of the investment decisions that come off, that, that you make, everything from the asset allocation in your portfolio to the investments that you select to go into that portfolio, all of those should be based around your goal. And that's really, really important when you're working with an advisor. So we'll start on that side of things. Um, and in just like as... Well, we talk about this saying that we always have at Morningstar, that we are about the investor and not the investment. And the advisor, any advisor you work with should be, should be similar. So if you walk in and all of a sudden, and hopefully this is lessening with commissions going away and everything else, but if you're walking in and the first thing an advisor is pitching you in your first meeting or in any meeting is investments, then that is a warning sign. So advisors should start with your goals. Every meeting you have with an advisor should be focused on your goals. Have your goals changed or circumstances? We'll get into circumstances a little bit, but have your goals changed in any way? Um, that should be the focus. And once we understand as an advisor, once the advisor understands your goals, then they're able to actually put you into a portfolio that makes sense. And there's a couple of other steps that are related to this. So how can you do this as an independent investor? Um, well, pretty simple. You can, once again, focus everything that you're doing around a goal, and that means defining your goals. And go back and watch that portfolio construction one. Listen to our portfolio construction um, podcast. I I think it's good, obviously, because I'm on it. But we walked through Shawnee's retirement goal um, and saw basically how that how the whole process worked from defining that goals to going through setting asset allocation, and then picking investments. Um, so you can do that on your own. One thing that's really, really important, we won't replay that whole episode, but one thing that's really important is making sure that the goal is really specific. So anytime you are setting a goal, you have to know when it's gonna happen, and all of this can change. Um, I think people don't like setting goals because they don't like going through the process, but also they are worried about what if something changes, particularly if you're setting a long-term goal like retirement. But Things can change, but you still need to define when something's going to happen, if it's retirement, when you're going to retire, um, how much you're going to need. Um, so what does the goal cost? And go through the process of figuring out how much you're going to need to support that retirement. Um, and if you can go through that go through that process, it can anchor your portfolio and anchor all of your investment decisions around something that's actually concrete. All right. Oh. Look at you, Will. Will, Will provided the podcast details. So Will is not just a pretty face. He is also contributing to, uh, to this. I can't tell sometimes if he's watching or checking NBA scores. All right. The next, uh, the next thing that's really important that we feel is really important here at Morningstar and working with advisors is taking a total wealth approach. And what this basically means is that you need context around anything you're doing from an investing perspective. And... With an advisor, it means they need to get to know you. 
um, and they should be asking you questions and they should understand what you do for a living. They should understand um, you know, where your compensation comes from and what are the different things that impact that compensation. Um, all of this is really important when you're investing. And you know, simple examples, people like to invest in similar things to what they do. So whether that's owning company stock for a company you work with, whether it's real estate agents that like to buy investment property, it's comfortable, it makes sense on a certain level, but it's also not a great approach to take. So it's not diversifying you very much. So if you work in the investment industry and you put all of your money into stocks in the investment industry, that's not great, right? If something happens to that industry, you could lose your job and all of your investments would go down. So this is why it's really important to make sure your advisor understands your career, understands your family situation and how that may impact um, cash flow. So in many cases, cash going out. Do you have elderly parents you need to take care of? Do you need to pay for your children's education? Um, and they need to understand sort of the lifestyle that you're living in, where you live, how different, uh, how different economic conditions are going to affect your life. Um, so make sure that you take a total wealth approach. Make sure your advisor really understands you. You can't sort of take your portfolio and look at it um, without taking this holistic approach. If you're an independent investor, you just need to sit down and think about what are the real drivers of you and your family's income and expenses. Um, so important to take take a step back and look at that. And that can inform some of the investment choices that you're going to make. All right, this is my favorite one. So we'll spend more time on this risk. Um, so this will be my little diatribe for today. So there are very different ways that people look at risk. So risk, of course, when we are looking at investing generally is measured in terms of volatility. So the risk is how much is your portfolio going to bounce around? Um, and volatility is is a, a perfectly fine way to measure risk. Um, but we at Morningstar see the risk as being as not being able to obtain your goal, achieve the goal, that the whole reason that you're investing. So let's talk about how risk traditionally has been handled with financial advisors. So typically, and this is a regulation that they do need to do this, traditionally you would walk into a financial advisor and they would give you a risk questionnaire. Now, a risk questionnaire is going to walk you through different scenarios to try to figure out what your um, your risk tolerance is. So, you know, a very simplistic way of looking at this is the risk questionnaire will say if the market goes down 30 percent. So if your portfolio goes down 30 percent, what are you going to do? And so then you have to assess how much this bothers you and how much it's going to influence your actions, whether it's I'm going to freak out, sell everything I own, and uh, and wait till this terrible calamity ends. To I would actually invest more because valuation levels were cheaper. So that's a risk questionnaire. And then the risk questionnaire generally will inform the portfolio that an advisor will put you into. Um, so what is that asset allocation that they're going to put you into? So if you are really really worried about losing money, they're going to put you in a portfolio that has a lot of fixed interest and cash. Now, this is a terrible way to do this. I guess I didn't really couch that much. Um, but this is a terrible way to do this. So there's a couple problems with it. Number one, none of us can actually assess risk, um, or most of us can't assess risk in these scenarios without them actually happening. It's the equivalent of somebody sitting there and saying to you, what would you do if you walked into a pub and someone pulled a gun on you? And you're supposed to assess how you would um, react in this very stressful situation, most people get it wrong. Um, so people do not have the ability to actually assess their risk. And there's been study after study that says these risk questionnaires, even if this made sense, they're still inaccurate. So that's the first problem. The bigger problem is that um, your tolerance to risk has nothing to do with establishing a goal or actually achieving a goal. So what good does it say if I sit there and truthfully say that I am really risk adverse, I don't want volatility in my portfolio, well, that's great. And so I can invest completely in cash and never achieve my goal. And it's not framing this risk, um, it's not framing risk in the right way. So how risk should be framed is, okay, you want to retire with this amount of money. In order to get there, you need a certain required rate of return, which means you need to invest in risky assets like stocks. 
then if you frame it that way, people can make a decision and understand that there's a trade-off. So when they sit there and they say, I'm too worried to invest in stocks, you say, okay, your retirement, instead of having a million dollars, you're now going to have $100,000 in retirement and frame risk appropriately. So this is once again, going back to those goals and, uh, and making sure that your goals are established. And that will inform how much risk you should take in your portfolio. And that will actually allow you, by anchoring to that goal, hopefully that will allow you to withstand the volatility in your portfolio. And another thing I would add is there is huge gender bias in the way risk is applied by financial advisors. So women are put in, and there's been study after study after study, women are put in more conservative portfolios because Either there is a inherent bias that women are risk adverse or, um, well, yeah, there's inherent bias that women are risk adverse. So advisors put them into safer portfolios. So there have been these blind studies that have gone in where a man will go in with the exact same goals, exact same portfolio, exact same um, everything. A woman will go in and she'll be put in a more conservative portfolio. So be very wary about these risk questionnaires um, and be very wary about, I guess, the approach an advisor would take with risk. It should be centered around your goal and it should be about the risk that you need to take in order to achieve your goal, not a risk tolerance questionnaire. I, I think they're fairly useless. I should probably be less aggressive about that. But anyway, so I think, so that's risk. So independent investor, so what do you do with an advisor? Make sure it's based on goals. Independent investor, you know, my favorite way to do this, which I'm sure people have heard if you've watched the portfolio construction one, is calculating a required rate of return. Required rate of return is simply with the amount of assets you have in your portfolio, with the amount that you're going to save going forward, um, and the time frame that you have, what is the return that gets you from those inputs to where you want to be, so that goal that you established. Now, the required rate of return can do a lot of things. Um, one, it can tell you if your goal is even realistic. If your required rate of return is 25%, probably not going to make it. Um, but it also informs then the asset allocation you're going to take. So if you have a required rate of return of 7%, you are not going to put all your money in cash because you will never get there. Um, so that is a way that as a individual investor that's self-advised, you can figure out what is the risk that I need to take on in terms of volatility in my portfolio to actually achieve a goal. And you, and if you are not um, comfortable with that risk, then you can adjust the other inputs, right? If you need to get that required rate of return lower, you can adjust inputs like you can, if we're using retirement as an example, you can retire later in life. You can have less money in retirement. You can save more. So at least then you get to make those decisions about things that you can control. That was my risk rant. All right, portfolio construction. So as I said in the beginning, selecting investments needs to be the last step that is taken. So if you walk into any sort of advisor or if you're an individual investor, investments are last. All the other stuff that we went through needs to happen first. Um, advisors invest in different ways. So there are, um, it's very unlikely that you are going to have an advisor that is literally in there picking from a giant universe of securities to put in your portfolio. So there are two different types of advisors. Um, if we want to generalize a little bit, there are advisors that outsource the investment management. So basically, they, they will outsource the selection of investments to somebody else, to an investment manager. And they'll focus on putting you in a portfolio that is based on your risk tolerance. Um, so once they figure out that, OK, you need to be in a um, conservative portfolio, then they'll go out there. They'll be set conservative portfolios. The other, uh, the other way that this works is that um, your advisor will have a list of approved investments that they can select from that an investment committee selected. Um, so this is sort of where there was trouble before because the approved investments were generally from the company that the advisor was associated with. A lot of that's gone away, but either way, there is either an internal or external investment committee um, that helps to select those investments. And we actually do some of that work here at Morningstar, different part of Morningstar that I work in, but, uh, but help advisors out with that process. Um, but either way, they have been vetted um, and advisors will simply select, select a mix of assets based on, uh, based on your risk tolerance. But I think the big thing with, with portfolio construction is, yeah, make sure that it is based on 
what your actual needs are um, in terms of obtaining your goal. All right, so we're going to switch to the second part of this. We're going to talk about behavioral coaching. So behavioral coaching is, uh, is another really important role that advisors can play. And so we'll take a step back and we'll talk a little bit about behavioral finance. So behavioral finance is, uh, is something that, I don't know, has been around for like 15 years, probably something like that. There's this guy, Daniel Kahneman, um, who is a professor, I believe, at Princeton um, that, uh, that talks a lot about this and sort of pioneered this field of behavioral, um, behavioral finance. And at the end of the day, all that it means is that as humans, we are hardwired in a lot of different ways to make poor investment decisions. And what, it, what this field studies is basically our inability to make rational decisions about our own investments or you know most of the rest of our lives. Um, and understanding and publicizing these biases that we all have in the hopes that then they won't impact you as much because you know about it. So we're going to go through a couple of these, but this is a really good role that advisors can play. One thing I would say, this is also a really good role that other people can play in your life. So it doesn't have to be a financial advisor. Um, I know there's a big stigma about talking about money and talking about investing, which I think is changing. And I certainly see it changing in younger generations. Um, but there is this stigma about talking about money. And so people don't share this. Um, but Talking about investment decisions that you're going to make with people you trust can be a way to remove a lot of these biases as well. But we'll go through it. So we did this all with quotes. Um, and we'll talk about confirmation bias. So here we go. Warren Buffett. You need a Warren Buffett quote in anything that you do right around investing. So here's our Warren Buffett quote. And confirmation bias just means that we will deliberately seek out information um, that already supports our opinion about something. So we see this all the time with politics, um, as people have sort of veered off into their own little worlds or in the internet, um, where they're in this little echo chamber that's just reflecting their views. But this happens a lot with investing. So people make a decision, whatever it may be, the decision is after pay is going to $10,000 a share, and then they'll deliberately seek out um, or not even deliberately, they will just naturally seek out um, information that will support that point. So what can you do about confirmation bias? Well, one thing is if you have a friend and you want to talk about something with it, find friends that will actually express their opinion to you. Um, so that's, uh, that's one thing. The other thing is spend some time and deliberately sit there and challenge your own assumptions. So list the 10 reasons why you think Afterpay is going to $10,000, and then take the opposite argument and go find information that supports that opposite argument. People don't like doing this, but it is a good way to challenge your thinking. If everything works out well, maybe you're going to sit there at the end and say, hey, I was absolutely right. None of this other stuff makes any sense. But at least going through that exercise, you'll see why there are different opinions. And if you want to know why we don't think Afterpay is going to $10,000 a share, you can read our research reports. We think it's going down. But anyway, that's a different webinar. Overconfidence bias. Um, so a lot of investors um, face this. So Charlie Munger, now we've got Warren's, uh, Warren's partner at Berkshire Hathaway. Um, so what does it mean? It means that people are overly optimistic about the likelihood of their success. Um, so where this comes in from investing is that a lot of investors think that they are better at selecting investments than anybody else is. Um, so they are overconfident in that, um, and yeah, that can lead to that can lead some issues. So along with uh, confirmation bias, it's a pretty similar approach you can take to this, and a pretty similar approach that advisors can take to this, um, which just means that be cognizant of it. Understand that most people are overconfident. Spend some time thinking about your edge. What is the edge you actually have over other investors, um, and just quote unquote being smarter, that isn't really it. So spend some time thinking about where does your real advantage lie in terms of picking investments if that's what you're choosing to do. 
Uh, this is a good one. This is my favorite quote. So if anyone remembers Animal House, I talk about Animal House, the uh, the movie, and it's like crickets around here with uh, with my team. Um, since another example of me being old, Animal House. Interestingly enough, the author of Animal House, um, it's a movie about fraternities in the U.S. Was a member of my fraternity, um, a lot older than me, and at a different university, but still, fellow. Well, I won't talk about my fraternity. Um, so. Action bias is just the fact that we are hardwired to want to do something. So, and this is this whole fight or flight um, issue that we have, right? So, you know, we're all naturally hardwired to danger approaches us, whether it's some ferocious animal or something else, danger approaches us, we have to do something. We either run away from it or we go attack this thing. Um, so this action bias happens in markets as well. People feel like they need to do something. If the markets are going down a lot, especially, people feel like they need to do something, whatever that is. And they feel better about themselves once they've actually done something. So that can be selling everything you own, and then people feel a lot more comfortable. It can be switching around investments and moving into different investments. But either way, we feel like we need to do something with investing. <laughs> Most of the time, the right thing to do is nothing. Because every time you do something, something bad happens. There are transaction costs. There are, um, there are taxes you might have to pay. So most of the time, you shouldn't do anything. So investing is not supposed to be exciting. It's not supposed to be Wall Street, two phones, yelling orders into uh at God knows who, um, it's not supposed to be exciting. It's supposed to be boring. You're supposed to create a plan. You're supposed to stick to that plan and trudge along towards a, your goal through all sorts of different market conditions. But anyway, action bias. Anytime you're going to do something, take a step back, wait a couple days, see if you still feel like you need to do it. Um, I know we all think that we need to do stuff immediately, but waiting a couple days can be really smart. What you're going to lose potentially if the market changes or a position changes, if you're not a day trader, it's not going to matter in the long run. But taking a step back can prevent you from doing something stupid, which is our quote from Otter in Animal House. Um, there's a situation and yeah, what are we supposed to do? Something stupid. Recency bias is a good one as well. Um, so we've got a quote from Michael Lewis of Moneyball and many other books um, that he has written. Um, yeah, basically whatever we hear, whatever happens recently is something that, uh, something that will unduly influence what we're going to do. So you see this all the time with how people select funds and ETFs that people will not pay any attention. And then once a year, they'll sit there and look at what's done well and move all their money into that. Now we know this is a terrible, terrible move. There's been study after study after study including Morningstar's annual or every six months now, Mind the Gap study. The gap there we're referring to in that is the gap between how investments perform and how investors perform. So basically that measures what is the impact of dumb, thing that people, dumb things that people do. And there's a gap. And that gap gets larger during times of stress, during times of market stress where there's volatility. Um, but either way, it means that we make mistakes as investors by chasing hot investments. And that's really what recency bias um, applies to. And we talked about this on Tuesday when we were talking about some of the different financial crisis, crises that we are looking at. Um, the same thing happens every single time. The peak of investors in the market happens right at the top of the bubble. So that means all the way up, more and more investors are getting into the market. And then, of course, the market falls and everyone stops investing. Um, so we see this time and time again. Um, and that's just people seeing what happened in the future. Oh, stocks returned 11% last year. They're going to do 11% in the future. Um, that's what we see with recency bias. All right, information bias. God, we're going through a lot of these. This is why I shouldn't have just grabbed random slides after I deleted them all. Um, information bias. So we've got another quote from Warren Buffett. Um, we are inundated with information, um, and it's getting worse and worse and worse, right? So I think when Warren actually put together this quote, none of the stuff that's currently happening uh, in terms of technology, in terms of the fact that we are berated with information all the time, um, 
it was a lot less back then, but you're gonna get a lot of information. That information, once again, is gonna make you do things or encourage you to do things. Most of it is useless. So most of the stuff that you get about investing is completely useless. We try to focus on long-term concepts here at Morningstar, but whether that's an earnings report, whether that's just all the data and pronouncements that come out about everything that we have access to, ignore most of it. That will be, uh, that will be beneficial. Anchoring bias, here we go. Daniel Kahneman. Why are you just over there laughing? Cheers. Okay. Um, anchoring bias. So we anchor to the recent past. Um, and basically what this means is that what is happening, people assume it's just going to happen forever. Um, what's happening right now? Well, everyone's just decided, if we think about the market right now, everyone's just decided that we are never going to have inflation again. Interest rates are going to be low forever. And that's, that's fine. That is, uh, that's an assumption. It's unlikely that that's actually going to be true. But what people are doing is they're projecting certain environments um, into, uh, into all of their estimates out into the future. And if those change, if there's a change in the level of interest rates, if there's a change in inflation levels, we are going to see a lot of big problems in markets. Um, so just be careful. Go back and study more than the recent history um, to, uh, to understand what's going on. I don't know why that slides in there. Okay, those are all of our different biases. So now we need people to ask questions. Um, we've got a couple already. All right, so we've got a question from David. So David's saying, does Morningstar, um, does Morningstar have a fair value for the ASX? Yeah, so let me show you, David. I'm gonna share my screen. So this was a good question because I get to show something. All right, so if I go, so this is our website. If I go on to monitor markets, so first let's talk about what is a fair value. So the fair value is what our analysts think something is gonna be worth. So our analysts on every stock that they cover, they calculate a fair value on that share. Um, so that's what they think it's gonna be worth, what they think it's worth, and they do that by estimating cash flows out in the future, discounting them back to the present day. Then we compare that price to the market price, which gives us an idea, is a individual share overvalued? So what we do, David, is we roll up all of those fair values to a country level. Now, this isn't necessarily, now we cover most of the ASX 200, but we actually cover more. So this is not aligned with an index, it's aligned with a country, and what it represents is every security that we cover within that country. So if you go into monitor markets, you can go down and see, here's Australia. Um, so price to fair value of Australia and New Zealand. So 1.10 means that we think the market is 10% overvalued. So a price to fair value of one means that what our analysts think something is valued is exactly what it's trading for in the market. Anything above one is gonna represent something we think is overvalued. Anything below one we think is undervalued. So if we look at Australia, we think it's worth 1.10, so 10% overvalued. If we go back last year, a year ago today, we thought it was 15% undervalued. Now, of course, people that remember last year, we were approaching, so I think the 23rd, right, was the market low last year in March. So we're approaching that. Um, so that's why you see that comparison there. And incidentally, we have every other country we cover stocks in. So just go down and look by continent. And also, if you want to see, so if we take the UK, for example, click on the name, and what it'll take you to is our coverage universe within that market. So you can see that we cover 73 different securities in the United Kingdom. Um, then you can go through and see what they actually are. And if you want to, of course, you can sort um, by price for fair value. So if you go into valuation, there's price for fair value. So you can see what's our cheapest imperial brands, we believe, has the biggest discount to fair value in the UK, right under something I've never heard of, just eat takeaway, which sounds exciting. All right. 
Okay, so we've got another question from David saying, U.S. fund managers managing more than $100 million must file a quarterly S13 statement with the SEC. Do Australian fund managers have to do a similar thing? Okay, so I'll admit, I do not know what the S13 statement is. I assume that what that is is a disclosure statement of what they actually own. So I'm going to operate under that assumption. Let me know if that's wrong, David. Um, do Australian fund managers have to do a similar thing? Okay, so... Australia has terrible, terrible disclosure rules for funds. And it is honestly pretty ridiculous. And she's laughing because she knows that this is a favorite rant of mine. So fund managers in Australia do not have to disclose what's in their hold, what their fund holdings are. And the reason they say that they don't want to do this is they think people are going to front run them. Um, so somehow they're going to see that a fund manager is trying to build up a position. So fund managers, obviously, if you have a huge fund, it's not like when I trade and I'm just like, I want 100 shares and you get it. You have to be a little strategic about how you build up a position. But fund managers in Australia claim that they, well, they say that they don't want to disclose their holdings because they think people are going to take advantage of that. Now, that is ridiculous because Australia is the only developed country in the world that doesn't require fund managers to disclose every single holding they have. So if it doesn't happen in every other market, it's not going to happen here. They just don't want to do it. And in fact, they give their data to us um, because we rate a lot of these funds, but we're not allowed to publish it. Um, so it's ridiculous. Um, there's no reason for it. But no, you don't have to do it in Australia. So what funds will do is they will put up perhaps a quarter late, maybe their top 10 holdings. Um, so it's... Uh, yeah, it's interesting. That's my, there, there's no reason for it. It just punishes investors. Transparency is good. If you are a good fund manager, nobody cares what you're actually holding, or nobody's going to be able to do anything with what you're actually holding. So it creates problems. So one thing that we have, um, Morningstar, so where we can use the data of what's in those individual funds is our portfolio x-ray tool. So the portfolio x-ray tool basically takes a portfolio and gives you your asset allocation in that portfolio. Now, when you're looking at funds and ETFs, that's particularly important because you as an investor don't know what's in there. We know what's in there because um, they tell us. ETFs have to be published. So you know ETFs, but funds, we know what's in there. So what that allows you to see is your actual asset allocation. Um, which uh, which I think is helpful, but uh, but yeah, no, it's a it's not a great thing here. Um, all right, so we've got a question from Lisa of Alpaca Fame. Lisa, I can't believe you still tune into these things. You must be so sick of me talking about your alpacas. Um, I do have multiple pictures of them, by the way. Lisa sends me pictures of her alpacas, um, but uh, but that's for a different webinar an alpaca webinar. Um, so she goes, what happens to your goals when you retire and reach your goals? Um, how do you plan for the drawdown phase? Okay, so yeah, a couple things about this. Number one, you're supposed to never reach your goals, right? You're always supposed to be shooting for the stars, Lisa. Um, that's what my retired mother tells me. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so it is a problem, right? That everything that you do is centered around trying to actually get to this goal of retirement, and then all of a sudden you're retired the next day, and, uh, and what do you do? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, listen, there's, there's, a couple, there's a couple different problems that people struggle with. Yeah, they struggle to convert a portfolio into cash that they're going to take out. Um, and there's a couple different ways you can do this. So, you know, we've talked about the bucket approach on here before. Um, but as you approach retirement, you do, of course, want to start changing your asset allocation as you get older and hopefully bring down the volatility of your portfolio. Because what you don't want is your portfolio to go down a lot right before you retire. So we talked about that sequencing risk before. That's a problem. So that's why people generally move into more defensive assets as they reach retirement. Now, of course, now that we're all, in theory, living longer, um, we do want to make sure that we keep equities in our portfolio um, when we're in uh, when we're in retirement. But yeah, I think start looking at your life. I mean, I guess the approach I would take at least was start looking at your life in different phases because you're going to have different phases of retirement. You might be much more active when you're uh, when you're early in retirement, and over time there could be a transition to more medical expenses versus fun things like travel. Um, so yeah, I think you can still set goals 
in retirement, start breaking those goals down into uh, into different categories. Um, so we'll do we'll do a whole one on sort of the transition to retirement at uh, at some point. Um, but hopefully, that was somewhat helpful, Lisa. Although I felt like my answer was all over the place. Um, all right, we got a question from Edward. Does the valuation formula take into account the economic situation, low interest rates, and as a result, equities are the only place where you can invest? I often see that the value oh. says one thing, but the market has its own price. Yeah. All right. So two uh, two different things. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the process that we go through, but yeah, valuation. So we believe um, we believe there are times where there is a large divergence. Um, between the valuation levels of a market and what is actually justified by the fair value. And those are the times that we have to be cognizant of as investors. So um, there is obviously a theory that markets are completely efficient. I think that we've all, most people have accepted that that's not true. How efficient markets are is a um, is certainly a debate, but I think going back and looking historically, we have seen situations where they're clearly so the bubbles I was talking about on Tuesday, um, some really really down markets where stuff was absurdly cheap. There are times where there is certainly a divergence between the value and the price, and those are times we can take advantage of as an investor. Um, so when we look at those valuation. Um, formulas. Yeah, they take into account everything. So what they're trying to do is literally rebuild the future financial statements of every company that they cover. So our analysts all have these very complex models that are used to estimate literally every single part. And I'll show you, I'll show you part of it. Um, we don't publish the models, but we do publish part of it. So if I take a stock, uh, what do we want to do? We'll do afterpay because we have a very different valuation on afterpay than the market. We can see how much it's up today. Oh, it actually went down. Shocker. People must be freaking out on all of the investing boards. Um, so afterpay, $111. We think it's worth 40 bucks. Um, so yeah, we've got a pretty different valuation. Sean, our analyst, has a pretty different valuation. If you go on a forecast, you can actually see some inputs that go into these models. So yeah, they're literally recreating these financial statements of these companies going forward. So you see we've got adjusted earnings per share. So the A stands for actual, the E stands for estimates. So yeah, we think that Afterpay will actually be profitable. Shocker. Still giant negative free cash flow per share. Um, but you can see some of these estimates. Obviously, this is a company that does not pay a dividend because they have no money. Um, but uh that was a rude comment, but they don't pay they don't pay a dividend, but we do estimate all the dividends. So that's what our analysts are trying to do, and that means that they need to obviously look at all sorts of different economic environments. So they need to have an estimate about where interest rates are. They have to have an estimate around economic growth, because that's going to impact all of these different companies that they are covering. Um, so yeah, they do take that into account. Um, we uh, our our valuation estimates are something that we generally think will happen in three years. We understand that markets do fluctuate and markets are going to get to points where they are very overvalued or very undervalued. Um, so we do think it takes a little time to actually get to our fair value. But yeah, it takes into account everything our analysts are looking at. Oh, my favorite question ever. What's the difference between Morningstar premium fair value valuation and Morningstar quantitative fair value valuation? Um, all right, I'll try to answer this nicely since they're both Morningstar. So what we've done is we cover 1,600 stocks globally. Um, so 1,600, 1600 stocks, we have data, I think, on 45,000 stocks. So what we've done is we have tried to create, we only have a certain number of analysts. What we've tried to create is a quantitative way, basically a computer program that tries to replicate what our analysts do. So that is what the quantitative rating is. Now, what it originally was used for was to expand our coverage. So now that we can now we can cover 45,000 stocks trying to use the same methodology but not having a human do it, having a computer do it, having an algorithm do it. Um, so that is the difference. Now, we calculate the quantitative fair value, excuse me, um, we do quantitative ratings on stocks we cover as well. 
and a lot of brokers buy them from us. So on Morningstar Premium, Afterpay, for example, which is covered by Sean, our analyst. So Sean is going through and doing everything that I was talking about. He's doing a fundamental analysis on this company. He is building out a model. He is looking at the future prospects of this company. We have a quantitative rating, which I don't know what it is. We have a quantitative rating on Afterpay as well. So if I go to a stock, so everything you get on Morningstar Premium, for those 1,600 stocks roughly that we cover, you are going to get our qualitative rating. If I go to something, so this is a U.S. stock that I happen to own that's smaller, that we don't cover, you'll get the quantitative rating. So instead of Sean and Sean's whole research report, you get a description of our quantitative rating. We think it's three-star, all the same stuff, economic moat, none. Um, fair value calculations, all the same things happen. But for brokers, a lot of brokers will publish our quantitative rating on securities. They are different than our qualitative rating. They could be the same, but they're different because the difference is a human does one, which we think is better, and a computer does the other one. So hopefully that answered your question. Um, it is, there is a lot of, was I talking without showing you what I was doing? See, this is where you guys are supposed to say something. All right, I see nobody's paying attention. They're just thinking about going to the crown. Um, so I typed in healthcare services stock. So here's what you get. It has our quantitative rating right there. So all the same stuff, a description of how our quantitative ratings work, but you're not going to see that um, quantitative rating on things that we cover on Morningstar Premium, but some brokers do publish it. So hopefully that answered your question. I should have just not gotten out of bed today. This is the part where you're supposed to swing the camera to Shani and she takes over. <laughs> All right, so we got a question from Charles. So why does the Morningstar fair value for specific stock, which has a five to 10 year horizon, rise and fall substantially depending upon current or short term results? Um, okay, so let's go back to the screen this time. I um, so we'll go back to something we cover. What's something else that's fun to look at? Something else we think is, let's look at, we'll look at Crown since I'm going to go have a drink there. All right. So Angus, who recently had a child, just a little information about Angus. What's Angus's kid's name? Matilda. 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 Angus recently had Matilda. Tilly. Tilly. Um, so Angus, Tilly's dad, covers Crown. Um, so anytime that we change our fair value, um, we will put out a note and it will say pretty prominently that, and I can't think of something in particular. Okay, here, Angus raised his fair value estimate for shares in Crown by 3%. Um, and so anytime we do raise our fair value or lower our fair value, you will see it in the note. If you're looking at quantitative ratings, the fair value bounces around a lot more than it does for a qualitative rating. But anytime the fair value is changed, and you can see here, Angus is explaining why he changed it, you will see a note. So my advice would be to go look at that note, read why we're actually changing the fair value. Um, generally for her quanti qualitative rating, so ratings by humans like Angus, um, generally those do not bounce around that much, um, but there are some big bounces in quantitative rating just because of the different inputs into the model. Um, okay. Well, it seems like we're out of questions, although we did have a lot of people say hi. So if you have any other questions, now is the time to ask. Um, the last thing I will share, which always gets more questions, is where we keep these recordings. So two places. So number one, um, you can go on to our Learn to Invest section. We have our latest March ones. It is now March, apparently. Um, you can see some of the previous ones that we have on there. Will always manages... I mean, look at this, Will. Will always manages to get like an embarrassing freeze frame of me. The other thing you can do is use our friend Google and say, morning star. I'm now nervous to look at the questions. 
uh, YouTube AU. You can go to our YouTube channel, Will's Pride and Joy, and all of these things are... Oh, this is a really awkward video where Will made me walk while he filmed me on it. Um, you can go to Playlists, Investing Bootcamp, and they're all on here. Um, so that's the other option that you can go. All right, now I'm scared to look at the comments. Um, all right, so I think we're done. How's that? All right, well, thank you guys for joining. I will be more organized on Tuesday. I will not delete everything that I have. But anyway, thank you for joining. If you guys have any questions, um, please uh, please send them to mark.lamonica1 at morningstar.com. Any advice in this video is general advice prepared by Morningstar without reference to your financial objectives, situation or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest.